So I've been playing around with something called React 3 Fiber, which is basically a declarative approach of using the 3JS library. If you don't know what 3JS, it's a 3D JavaScript library that you can use to render out 3D objects. But React 3 Fiber just makes it a little bit easier to use because it's declarative, it's all based in React, and it makes it very easy to just like add models and have them displayed. So in this example, we have two boxes and you can change the position just by using like React props. And the position, this is something important when it comes to 3D is understanding positioning. So there's X, Y, and Z. And all of these axes will change like, you know, the box location, either be up, it'll be left, right, up, down, or depth. So like towards you or away from you. So you can kind of play around with this. If I were to change the Y and put it to like a three, it's gonna move it up. So the Y axis is up and positive is gonna make it go up. All right, let's also play around with the Z. The Z is typically depth. So like if you're looking at the object here, if I were to do a positive Z, it's gonna to come towards the camera. A negative Z will go away from the camera. And then of course, X is just gonna move it left and right. So if I give this a two, it's gonna to move to the right, a three. So wrapping your head around that can be a little challenging when it comes to 3D if you're not used to it. This is the library and I wanna show you kind of what I built out. There's a ton of third party libraries in this ecosystem. The ones you're probably gonna end up using if you're building a like game or something is React 3 Rapier, which is a 3D physics engine. And then also React 3 Dre, is that what it's called? Or D-R-E-I. So kind of read through those, you're gonna end up using those. So you could read through the docs and try to understand how this works. I'm just gonna show you what I built and then walk you through like some of the stuff I've learned over the past day of playing around with this. So we got a 3D scene here. We have a player, I'm moving around with WSAD. We have a camera that's locked onto that player with an isometric perspective. We have a mouse where I can move my mouse around the, the screen. I don't know where my mouse went, but there's a red dot over here. And if you move the mouse, the player looks at that red dot. And then also we have some physics. So we have collidables with these boxes here. These are 3D models I found online and loaded them up. The player model I found online and also the textures for the plane underneath the player's feet is a PNG file I found online as well. So if you're interested in learning more about how this works, I'm gonna walk you through how I set all this up with Vite locally. And I'll just give you a quick little overview of how React 3 Fiber kind of works. Again, I'm still learning it. So everything I say, like correct me if I say anything wrong. Let's start off with just understanding how this project works. So this is a Vite app. I tried setting this up with Next.js 15 and it just didn't work. It just kept crashing. So I said, you know what, screw Next.js. Let's just use Vite like a real engineer. And I started setting up the application. So the main entry point, we have this app component and we have a div that is basically full width and full height of my browser window. And we have some things that we start creating. I'm gonna come back to keyboard controls in a little bit. I don't wanna dive into that just yet. But the main thing is you have a canvas here. And in the canvas, you can define, for example, a scene. Now, for what I've seen with building out games with like 2D game engines is that typically every part of your game is built up of scenes. Like you might have like a landing page that could be a scene. You may have a character select screen that could be a scene. And then you have your actual gameplay, which could be a scene, et cetera. So you have the scene and you use different React components to kind of build up the different objects in your scene. And also you can do stuff like this to give it 3D physics. So let's just walk through all this code and I'm gonna kind of dive into the easiest stuff first and then start going into the more complicated stuff such as the player object. So the first parent component is this physics engine. So this is built into this Rapier library. You basically wrap all your stuff in a physics component and then it's going to apply, you know, gravity, friction, impulses, uh, collisions, whatever, 3D stuff that you want. It's, it's really cool. You can check it out. You can have like balls like bouncing into each other or boxes falling down. But mine's pretty static. I just want to make it a really static game that you can kind of move around. So the first thing I want to kind of talk about is the ground. How does the ground work? This is probably the easiest component out of most of these. Let me get rid of some of those comments. So we have this ground component and when this thing first mounts it's going to load in a cobblestone texture so i have this png that i found online of this cobblestone and once the texture is loaded i basically repeat it a couple of times because if you don't do this it's going to be really scaled up and it just looks pretty bad um, but i'm going to go ahead and just like change it to eight and you'll see that it makes the cobblestone a lot smaller if i were to go back and change this to like a, a one you'll see it makes it huge. So that's kind of what that's doing. Um, I think eight actually looked pretty good. I might keep it at eight. Secondly, this should probably be in a use effect. I think it might be fine to just have it here. Um, I don't know if this is gonna keep rerunning over and over again. 
Yeah, I think it only runs once. The way React 3 Fiber kind of works, it's super performant because it doesn't have to keep on like re-rendering all your components. It kind of runs them once from what I understand. And then that'll create three JS objects under the hood and render those to your canvas. But anyway, I got off on a tangent. How does the ground kind of work? So the ground, first of all, we have a rigid body and this is telling that physics engine that, hey, whatever meshes I put into the scene, like make sure that it has hitboxes and they're collidable and you can add friction to them, etc. So when it comes to rigid bodies, you have a couple of properties you can pass in. So like the type, if it's fixed, that means that it just sits there in the scene. It doesn't move, right? If you want it to have like some type of gravity or whatever, you might need to do dynamic. Let me go to the player real quick. And yeah, this is type dynamic. So technically, if you do dynamic, then gravity will apply to it and it'll kind of like fall down in the scene. But let's just keep going. So we got the position of this thing. And there's also friction you can apply to objects. So like if you were to increase the friction and you actually use like an impulse for movement, the player would slow down a lot faster. Or you can kind of like act as if they're walking on glass or like ice if you put this really low. Um, but we're actually not using friction, so I'm going to get rid of that. So inside the rigid body, I'm defining a mesh. And a mesh allows you to basically supply the geometry. So in our case, we have a plane that is, you know, 20 by 20 in size. And you can do like different types of geometries. You could do like spheres, you could do cubes, you could do cylinders, stuff like that. Um, but basically a mesh is composed of a geometry and then also some type of material, right? And so the material that we're applying to this mesh is that texture we loaded in for the cobblestone. So I can go ahead and just like change this out if you wanted to, and you want to try out different cobblestone patterns. You can do that. So we have like three different uh, variants there. I also have like grass and sand. So if I do like a grass of one, you'll see that we have grass over there. Anyway, let's just go back to the normal cobblestone because I think it looks good with the two. Okay, so that geometry should make sense. But for the mesh, there's a bunch of different meshes. There's like mesh basic, there's distance, Lambert. I think most of these are like related to lighting, like Fong material is like a lighting. Um, but I'm just using the standard and I'm applying that texture to it. And then you can kind of change the coloring of it. For example, if you wanted to make it look a little bit more white, you can kind of increase that emissive intensity. And I just want to make it 0.5 to give it, you know, brighten it up a little bit. But anyway, that's how the ground kind of works. Okay, so you make a rigid body, you make a mesh, you have a geometry, and you have some material that you apply to it. And you can also like rotate and change positions and stuff. But that should make sense. Okay, so let's look at the next thing, the crate. The crate is where we actually brought in a 3D model. So right now I'm positioning these crates with different locations. And if you look at the crate, it's very easy to understand. We load in that crate model, which this crate model I found on fab.com and I just searched for a free model and then I went to download and I downloaded this GLB format. I don't know what format's the best. I just, you know, follow GLB because that was in the tutorial. And once you have that model, I put it inside of this models directory here. We have crate and we have soldier. And you can load in that model right here. So use GLTF is a hook. You pass it your model file, and then it's going to load that in. And then you can actually use that object and kind of pass it to a primitive. So primitive, again, there's a lot about this I'm trying to understand and learn. But a primitive just basically takes in the object as is and just like renders it. But you can also like render out the materials and the... Um, the geometry manually if you understand what's inside that glb file these glb files have a bunch of different things in it and so if you want to kind of dive into what is in this file you have to go and look at like a playground or load up a sandbox import the model look at the file definition and figure out what materials and what geometries exist there and you have to manually kind of glue it all together the easiest thing i found doing is just using a primitive it just passes the object and it just renders out perfectly fine but again, the crate. So the crate, again, is a fixed type of body. If you don't do fixed, if you do like dynamic instead, I think the player could potentially run into these things and move them, okay? Which is pretty cool. I mean, that might be something that you want to add to the game where you want to be able to walk into objects or barrels like in Half-Life 2 and move them around. But in my particular scenario, I want them to be static. So I'm going to go ahead and just do fixed. And then, of course, you can just do the position and stuff like that. Some of these things, I don't know if we even need. Do we even need a group here? we might not even need a group okay so that's kind of how i'm trying to learn just like what do i need what do i not, not need and just delete stuff so okay so that's the box we talked about the ground and the box okay so now we have a cursor so the cursor is a lot more involved um i'm not going to give a complete walkthrough how this kind of works but basically how it works is we have a mesh again which has a ring geometry and it has a material 
Now, the material is just like a red color, like something super basic, but it just kind of acts as a way of using a cursor inside of the 3D world. But if we wanted to try to understand how this is working, basically what it does is every time the game renders a frame, we look at where the current cursor is, so mesh.currentPositionSet, and we move that red dot to match the cursor position. Okay, And then we apply a rotation based on that cursor. And then if this method is defined, I basically call it to rotate the player. Honestly, I don't know why I'm using window here. I think I need to rethink how I'm designing this. But I think in the player object, which we'll cover in a bit, there is a method called update player rotation, which is going to rotate the player towards that cursor. We won't cover that right now, but this is how the cursor is moving around on the map. There's also some logic here to know if we are currently locked in. So like when I click on this screen, my mouse gets locked into the screen, okay? And there's logic a little bit different than when you're locked in versus when you're not locked in. And I think that's what that if statement is doing. I'm not gonna pretend like I actually know what's going on here. Um, I could spend time trying to understand it, but I just wanted a really basic cursor. Let's move on to something else. So like you can do ambient lighting. So ambient lighting is like the overall ambience of the scene. So if you increase that, everything in your game is gonna kind of become brighter or you can change it to make it darker. And then there's directional light, which you can have like, for example, a sun in the sky or like a, a, a spotlight that's shining light in a particular direction. Now, when it comes to the directional lighting, there's a way to do shadows. I just have to go and read the docs because I've forgotten how to do it. So those are like the easy objects in this. Let's look at the actual player object. This is where it gets a little bit exciting to understand. So again, the player, we're loading in that soldier model and then we are displaying it down here in this primitive. That's how the soldier is kind of displayed. Also, I'm grouping it to kind of change the positioning because based on the model, it depends on where their origin is in the model. You might have to kind of like manually change positioning from what I understand. But something I want to point out is that this player, again, it's a rigid body. And I went ahead and set colliders to false because I guess when you don't do that, the model you load in might have a hitbox on it and it's going to try to use that by default. I said, I don't want to use that. Instead, I want to add a cylinder collider and I want to manually define how tall it is, how wide it is and stuff like that. So I added a cylinder collider, which allows me to collide with these boxes. And that's how that works. Also, what can I talk about for the player? So there's two things that are kind of important to talk about. There's the camera updating. So when I press WASD, if you go back to the main app, I have this keyboard controls thing that I'm bringing in from this DREI library. And when I press W or S or A or D is basically setting some keys for forward, backwards, left, and right. Now these controls are just basically updating some shared state. Now if I go back to the player, I think there's a use keyboard controls hook and that's hooked into, you know, the state that's being updated and I have a get keys method. So basically every frame when this game renders, I'm getting the current keys and I'm checking if forward is down, if backwards is down, if left or right is down and I'm manually updating velocities on this player, right? There's also something called impulses that you can use. I tried using it and it just didn't feel that good uh, in terms of gameplay. So I switched it to just manually update uh, velocities every game update. And that's how the player basically moves around. So like when I press, you know, W, A, S, D, it's just increasing velocities on this phys physics object and moving that player around. But the important part I want to point out is the camera. So after I update the player, I basically tell the camera that I want to change the position. I'm using a lerp. Lerp is a mathematical formula that basically smooths out the movement. And so instead of the camera like instantly moving towards the player is, it's going to slowly transition towards the player. So it's kind of like a delayed lag of the camera. It just makes it look a little bit nicer. I mean, you can change how fast it's going to snap with this parameter down here. Like if you want to do really slow, I could do like 001 and then I'll show that it's going to slowly go after the player. Okay. Now I'm also setting the field of view, which I don't know why I'm doing this every single time. Like, I don't think I need to do these every time. I could probably do these in an effect and just do them once or something or have like a player or sorry, have like a camera entity or something. But anyway, I'm just doing that for now. And then finally, I'm telling the camera to look at the player, all right? So not only am I just moving the camera around, I'm repositioning how it's looking at the player. So that kind of allows it to, uh, as you saw when it was slowly lurping, it kind of like looks at the player as the player moves around and then it moves the camera towards the player. 
Um, there's a bunch of other helper functions in here. There's like the rotation. Okay, let's talk about the rotation. So again, that cursor object, when I move the cursor around the page, it potentially calls this window update player rotation. And all that's doing is doing an ATAN between the current cursor location in the player position. ATAN2 is how you can get a theta between a target point and the current point. And once I have that theta, I just set the rotation. And the rotation is used down here when I render out that group. I basically say, hey, rotate the player based on that theta. And that's how the player is basically following that point. Okay, so a lot of cool stuff going on in this little prototype. Um, what else is there that I could talk about? I think that's about it. I mean, there's some random stuff about pointer locks and stuff like that. But overall, um, I'm having a lot of fun playing around with this. I might get more into 3D and game dev, but still try to incorporate it back into web dev. Maybe we'll make an online multiplayer 3D game. Might be pretty cool. But uh, those are the things I've learned playing around with React 3 Fiber, highly recommend. It's pretty easy to get a scene set up. And so if you wanna have like some cool 3D animation on a landing page, super easy to do, right? Just set up a canvas, grab a model, position it, rotate it, and then put it on your screen. And then you can have your normal DOM elements overlay text onto your scene if you want to. Yeah, I guess just let me know if you guys enjoy this content. I'm gonna keep experimenting with React 3 Fiber a little bit and see if I can build out something more polished, something that's more exciting, and maybe you guys can actually play a game with me online uh, when I have this finished up. All right, that's about it. Have a good day. Happy coding.